this webinar on why investing heavily in small modular reactors, SMRs, is not a good fix for addressing climate change. My name is David Schlissel, and I, I am IEFA's Director for Resource Planning Analysis. We are very fortunate today to have two excellent speakers for this webinar. Uh, Naomi Oreskes is Henry Charles Lee Professor of the History of Science and affiliated an affiliated professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. She is a world-renowned Earth scientist, historian, and public speaker, and the author of the best-selling book, Merchants of Doubt. She focuses on the role of science in society, the reality of anthropogenic climate change, and the role of disinformation in blocking climate action. Naomi has a new book uh, coming out soon entitled The Big Myth, How America Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and, lo and Love the Free Market. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark Jacobson is Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program at Stanford University. He focuses on air pollution, global warming, and developing large-scale renewable energy solutions. Mark has developed three-dimensional atmosphere, biosphere, ocean computer models, as well as roadmaps to transition countries, states, cities, and towns to 100% clean renewable energy. Uh, Mark has a book just recently issued entitled No Miracles Needed. Uh, before I ask uh, Mark and Naomi to start, I want to remind everyone that if they are interested in reading what we at IEFA have written about SMRs, just go to IEFA, IEEFA.org and search for SMRs. Second, after our speakers finish in about 30 minutes, uh, they will be available to answer your questions. If you don't have time to answer everyone's questions, we will try to send an answer after the webinar. It's my understanding that you can put the uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and so we're ready to go. Uh, Mark? Uh, thank you very much, David. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about well, why we don't need small modular nuclear reactors, but I think I'll start with why we don't need large reactors and why it's not going to help to go to small reactors. Uh, first, you know, we, we face a humongous crisis, not only in terms of climate, but air pollution and energy security. Um, Seven million people die from air pollution every year. And <clears throat> this is due to about 90% of these deaths are due to combustion, fossil fuel and biofuel combustion. Uh, climate change, global warming is also due primarily to combustion. About 75 to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions and dark particle emissions are due to combustion from fossil fuels and biofuels. And energy security is the third major problem that we have to solve. Fossil fuels are limited resources. They will run out over time. So we do need to uh, alternative to fossil fuels. Also, many countries rely on the imports of energy from other countries, fossil fuel energies, and that obviously results in economic, social, and political uh, insecurity and instability, as we can see in Europe right now. Uh, and there are other types of energy instability. So these, these are three major problems that require immediate and drastic solutions. In fact, for air pollution, I mean, every year we lose 7 million more people. So we need some solutions that can be implemented immediately. We cannot wait you know, 10 years, 15 years for them to be implemented. Global warming, I mean, to avoid 1.5 degrees global warming, we'll need to eliminate at least 80% uh, of emissions by 2030. That's seven years from now, and 100% uh, ideally by 2035 or 40, and certainly no later than 2050. So any technology that takes 10 years between planning and operation is really not useful at all for helping to solve the climate problem, let alone the air pollution problems or energy security problems we face. So that gets us to, well, well, wind and solar, for example, their lead times between planning and operation are between 
a uh, half a year for rooftop solar to you know usually one to three years for utility scale solar and on, onshore wind. And so these technologies are not only the cheapest technologies by far in the world today, the new wind and solar, uh, but also the fastest that can be deployed. Nuclear, on the other hand, in liberalized markets, it's taking 17 to 22 years between planning and operation. And we can look in, in Flamanville in France, Hinckley in, in the UK, Okoloto in Finland, the Vogel plants in Georgia, they're all 17 to 22 years between planning and operation. A lot of that's planning and then uh, a lot of that's construction time as well. And the costs are enormous for the, uh, for example, Hinkley, sorry, not uh, Vogel in Georgia, these two reactors, their aggregated costs are $34 billion so far for 2.2 gigawatts. That's, that's over $15 per watt. Uh, capital costs, new wind and solar are $1 per watt. So 15 times over 15 times higher capital costs. And the cost of energy is now over seven to eight times higher as a result for new uh, large scale nuclear reactors. And so you're basically taking on the order of, you know, anywhere from 16 to, uh, you know, 16 to 21 years longer for to get a technology that costs seven to eight times more. Uh, so just from, and, that, and so we, again, we need to solve 80% of the problem within seven years. Having some technology that's not available, uh, if we start planning it today, it's not gonna be available for at least 17 years. It's just completely useless for helping solve the climate problem, let alone the air pollution problems we face. Well, of course, that's not, those are the only problems associated with uh, traditional nuclear reactors. The other, there are energy security problems associated with them. Uh, weapons proliferation, uh, at least five countries have secretly developed weapons under the guise of civilian nuclear energy programs. Uh, there's meltdown risk. 1.5% of all nuclear reactors ever built today have melted down to some degree. Uh, there's waste issues. What do you do with all the waste that's accumulating at all these reactors? And you need to store that waste for at least 200,000 years. And the, there's not, that's, that's a perpetual problem. Uh, that not only costs a lot of money, but just it, it results in a risk to human health. Uh, there's underground uranium mining risk uh, because of the byproducts, polonium, uh, for example, decays very rapidly and is, is carcinogenic. Uh, you get from radon, radon decays to polonium, and that's within 10% of underground uranium miners historically have died from lung cancer. Uh, beyond those who are from smoking. And so that is a, you know, that's a risk for underground uranium mining that will continue. Uh, then there's there's actually greenhouse gas emissions and, and heating from large reactors that most people are not aware of. Uh, for example, well, a huge amount of energy goes into mining and refining uranium continuously. And in addition to building the nuclear reactors themselves, but you know, nuclear reactors, they produce heat and that's a, not a greenhouse gas, but that's just added directly to the air and uh, contributes to a portion of global warming. That's anthropogenic heat emissions. And there's the anthropogenic water vapor emissions from nuclear reactors from all the water that's used to cool the reactors. Uh, so when we actually calculated, looked at, well, what, is the, what are the life cycle emissions when you account for not only the fact that you have the biggest source of additional emissions from nuclear is the fact that because you're waiting an extra uh, on the order of 15 years between planning and operation for nuclear compared with wind or solar, you're, you're running the regular, while you're waiting for your nuclear reactor to be built, you're running the regular electric power grid, which contains a lot of fossil fuels. So those emissions, or what we call opportunity cost emissions, uh, are huge. I mean, though, just by waiting around, not doing anything, we're putting a, a, a huge amount of pollution and carbon into the air. And so when you add that, plus the anthropogenic heat, plus the anthropogenic water vapor, plus the uh, emissions associated with building these reactors. And just to give you an example of how significant these emissions are, I mean, the Vogel plants in the US that are being built, they're on years 18 and 19 between planning and operation. Well, just during the construction, they've put enough, they've laid enough cement to build a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle. And that those carbon emissions are, have been, so are a huge amount of carbon emissions associated with the building of that reactor. And there hasn't been a single kilowatt hour of electricity generated from that plant in the 18 years that we've been waiting, those plants in the 18 years we've been waiting. 
Well, when you account for these emissions, the opportunity cost emissions and all these other emissions, you find that nuclear actually emits nine to 37 times more carbon dioxide equivalent emissions than uh, onshore wind. And so even though it's still gonna be less than gas, I'm not saying it's worse, it's, it's less than gas, but it's still substantial. It's not zero like everybody claims. It's, it, there are uh, significant emissions associated with it. Okay, so all those problems. So what about the small modular reactors? Well, first of all, we used to started building small modular reactors before large reactors. And we went to large reactors because of the economies of scale uh, indicated that it would be cheaper to build larger reactors. And so now we're going back, forgetting that history. Uh, so there's no expectation that it's going to be cheaper uh, to have uh, small modular reactors. The, the most, uh, uh, the latest estimates of when the small modular reactors will be available, I mean, just for testing purposes, just to uh, test facilities, maybe by 2030. And so seven years from now, we may have a reactor to test, and then we can see what all the, all the other problems associated with those reactors are. We do not have time to waste for that. Why should, you know, there's no indication that it's going to be on average, take less time for these small modular reactors to be planned and operated than the large ones. So the, the cost, there's no, no known benefit of the cost. There's no known benefit of the timing between planning and operation. Uh, what about weapons proliferation? Well, they're smaller and they're designed to be shipped around the world. So this increases the chance of weapons proliferation through enriching uranium uh, or uh, harvesting plutonium uh, from, from uranium. Uh, enrichment. And like today, I mean, the reason we have weapons proliferation, a lot of it is because if a country has a nuclear uh, energy plant, then often they will hide the imports of uranium or the weapons development under the guise of civilian nuclear energy development. And so this just allows more countries to have uh, reactors and they can then pretend that they're only using it for, uh, for civilian purposes. Well, meltdown risk, we just don't know. Each model will have its different meltdown risk. Uh, the uranium will still come from, part of it will come from underground mines, so that's still a risk. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions, again, opportunity costs don't disappear, so we still have background emissions. We still have heat coming from these reactors. Uh, probably cooling water will be required, uh, and they're still going to have to be constructed. So we're still going to have some carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, waste, well, the ones that will have less waste, well, they'll have more enriched uranium, and therefore they'll be closer to weapons-grade uranium, be more of a weapons proliferation risk. Um, bottom line is we have the we have 95% of all the technologies we need today to solve the climate and air pollution problems and energy security problems we face, and we know how to do the rest. There's no need for, quote, miracle technologies that um, may or may not be available in uh, seven to 10 or 15 years. Uh, we, those are opportunity costs. We should direct the funds for that are being spent on these small modular reactors and big reactors now, spend them on things that we know work and that can be implemented right now. The key is to deploy, deploy, deploy. That, that is what is necessary. We need to deploy existing technologies as fast as possible. And that will allow us to eliminate more and more emissions immediately than we'll ever be able to eliminate with these small modular reactors that may or may not ever uh, hit the ground. I'll stop there for now. Great, thank you. Um, I guess it's over to me then. Thanks, Mark. That was really, uh, really great. So what I'd like to do is complement what Mark just said uh, by talking about three specific things. I want to talk first of about the specific problems of siting nuclear reactors in the United States, something that I think is really important to understand and doesn't often get discussed. And then I want to shift to talk about the larger backdrop of nuclear power generation as a technology and what we've learned from that history. As Mark said, there's a lot of forgetting, there's a lot of amnesia about the history of this technology, which is really a history of failed promises. And then to talk a little bit about why people still cling to the promise of nuclear power uh, despite its proven history of over-promising and under-delivering, because I think it's important to understand the psychology behind it in order to address it. So let me talk first about some specific problems in citing nuclear reactors in the United States. In my experience, many advocates of nuclear power think that they're being pragmatic. They think that realistically, nuclear power is the only energy source that can meet our future needs. 
So I think it can be useful to point out the many ways in which that's not true. I mean, Mark's already pointed out some of them in terms of the time frame, but an additional aspect has to do with the problems of citing. Even if we agreed in principle that nuclear power was desirable, and I don't, but I'm just for the sake of argument, there are actually very few places in the United States where it's practical. All nuclear power runs the risk of catastrophic accident. As the disaster at Fukushima showed, it's foolish to cite nuclear reactors in any seismically active region. And this rules out the entire West Coast of the United States, from California to Washington, a good deal of the basin and range, including Utah, which is one of the sites where small nuclear reactors have been uh, proposed, and a good part of the mid-continent, which many people don't realize is in fact seismically active. The risk of a major accident also means that we should not site reactors near heavily populated cities, which rules out most of the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic Corridor. Now, nuclear power also requires large amounts of water for cooling, and this rules out pretty much the whole Southwest and Texas. So what are we actually left with? Well, parts of the Southeast where the Vodal reactors have been being built, and maybe some parts of the Midwest. And public acceptance of nuclear power is actually fairly high in some of those regions. And as we've just said, some existing plants have licenses for expanded capacity. But realistically, what this tells us was that even if we like nuclear power, and even if we're affordable, most of the United States is simply not suitable for these plants. And even in the Southeast and the Midwest, we'd still have to deal with the radioactive waste, something that in 50 years of this technology, we have still not figured out. And as Mark points out, the risks of nuclear proliferation, which are often brushed aside by advocates, and of course, the cost. And that's the point. Nuclear power has never delivered on its promises. It hasn't been the miracle technology that its advocates envisioned back in the 50s, and it remains one of our most expensive sources of electricity. Contrary to what some people have claimed, Citizen opposition explains very little of the high costs, most of which arise from difficulties inherent in the technology and its management. And this brings me then to the larger backdrop of nuclear power generation as a technology and the history of failed promises in this industry. Most of us are familiar with the term too cheap to meter and the claim that was widespread in the 1950s that nuclear power would be quote, as free as the unmetered air. Its advocates promised nuclear everything. We would have nuclear submarines. We would have nuclear aircraft carriers carrying nuclear jet fighters, carrying nuclear weapons. And we would even have nuclear automobiles. Now, interestingly, most of these promises were not actually made by people in the industry. They didn't come from the CEO of Westinghouse or General Electric, but they came from scientists like John von Neumann and government officials like Louis Strauss, the head of the Atomic Energy Commission from 1953 to 1958. The only one of those promises that we got were nuclear submarines. So why? Why did nuclear power fail so conspicuously to live up to this promise? Well, I think that there was a conceptual error at the very heart of this technology. It was thinking about power in terms of the cost of fuel Rather, thinking about nuclear power as a problem in physics rather than as a technological system. It's true that a tiny amount of uranium can yield a vast amount of energy. So the fuel costs in fission reactors are low compared to the energy that they yield. But fuel is only one part and it turns out a rather small part of electricity generation. To generate electricity from nuclear fission, you need to control that energy. And that makes nuclear power intrinsically hazardous and therefore intrinsically expensive. You need multiple layers of safety precautions, both to keep the generators genuinely safe and to persuade the public of its safety. And that's where all that cement and concrete with its heavy greenhouse gas footprint, um, heavy carbon footprint, of course, comes in. And so the result of this is that nuclear power has always been extraordinarily expensive. And in 70 years of building these plants, the price has not come down. It's never been cost competitive in a market-based economy. And this is an important point because many of its advocates claim to be advocates of the free market, but this is not a free market and it never has been. France is the only country to have ever generated the lion's share of its electricity from nuclear power and it did so in a nationalized electricity industry 
that was managed by the government and heavily subsidized. Now, France is not the exception. In the US and around the globe, civilian nuclear power has always been massively subsidized. In the United States, left to market forces, we would never even have had a nuclear power industry. So why do we have one? Well, the short answer is not because of supply and demand. Nuclear power was not a response to commercial need. It wasn't then and it isn't now. In the 1950s, there was no consumer demand for nuclear power. At the time, fossil fuels were abundant and cheap. But there was a political demand and it was tied to the legacy of the Manhattan Project and the use of the atomic bomb against civilian populations at the end of World War II. When the war ended, there was an extensive criticism of the United States for using atomic bombs against innocent civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that criticism grew as the scientific evidence developed of the gruesome injuries that civilians had suffered in those cities and also the political evidence that the bombings were not in fact necessary to end the war. And in response by the late 1940s and the early 50s, the United States government was determined to prove that it had not done wrong in developing and releasing the power of the atom. And it set out to prove this in two ways. The first was to develop a commercial nuclear power industry in the United States. And the second was to export nuclear fission technology around the globe as part of the Atoms for Peace program. Because nuclear power was a response to a political problem, the US government was prepared to subsidize it to an enormous degree. And it did so in three main ways. First, through extensive research and development, particularly through the national laboratories, but also through grants to universities across the country. Second, by indemnifying the industry against lawsuits in the case of an accident under the Price-Anderson Nuclear Industries Indemnity Act, first passed in 1957, but renewed several times. And third, by taking on responsibility for nuclear waste disposal under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. No other industry has ever been absolved of responsibility for its own waste products. And that alone should make us wonder about this technology. So given all these problems, that the industry has never been cost competitive, that it's been massively subsidized, that it was never a response to demand, why do people still cling to this promise of electricity too cheap to meter? And especially given, as Mark has just said, that it's so much more expensive than alternatives and it takes too long to be a meaningful response to the climate crisis. Well, this I think relates to a deeper philosophical problem, the problem of scarcity versus the problem of abundance. Many Americans don't want to accept the idea that we might need to use less, consume less, that there might, be a, there might actually in the end be limits to growth, that the American way of life might need to be rethought and we might need to learn to live much more the way other people around the world do. As we all I'm sure have heard the statistics were 4% of the world population, but we use 25% of the world's resources. And that figure has scarcely changed in my lifetime. Many Americans see America as a land of plenty, that the promise of America is a promise of material plenty. And the suggestion that we might have to be more careful with resources is often taken as a personal insult, a limit of individual freedom. Now, these views tend to be held particularly strongly on the right wing of the American political spectrum. Growth and abundance are seen as linked to American capitalism, which is linked to individual freedom and material prosperity. Consumption is viewed as a good thing, a sign of wealth, a sign of success. And so the suggestion that we might have to do with less is often taken as deeply problematic by people who consider themselves to be politically conservative. Now there's a deep irony in this story because the original philosopher of scarcity, the 18th century philosopher Thomas Malthus was himself a political conservative. He believed that the limits of natural resources, primarily land for agriculture, meant that people needed to exercise restraint, particularly by not having more children than they could afford to feed. He used this as a reason not to support social welfare because he felt it allowed people to avoid the logical consequences of their activities. Now, 18th century progressives who believed in social welfare, who believed in taking care of the poor, tended to reject Malthus. 
And in the 19th and 20th century, their views were validated by technological advances that made it possible to grow more food on less land, while advances in public health made it possible for people to live longer and healthier lives overall. But somewhere along the line, the politics of scarcity flipped. Progressives became concerned about pollution, leading to focus on what we now know as planetary limits. Meanwhile, conservatives' commitment to economic growth led them to resist the idea that there were limits to growth. And for some, for some conservatives, this led to climate change denial, which is what I wrote about in my book, Merchants of Doubt, denying the reality of climate change at all. But for others, it led to the idea that the solution to climate change had to be nuclear power. And we've seen this among many of the uh, advocates of nuclear power, um, many of whom previously were climate change deniers and now say, well, okay, there's climate change, but we can fix it with nuclear power. Because this seems to be the only solution that enables us to escape the limits to growth. So nuclear power seems to suggest, at least to some people, that we can continue to avoid the Malthusian dilemma, continue to use more, do more, and that we don't have to exercise restraint. And this, I think, is why the issue is so politicized and why we see so much support for nuclear power among conservatives rather than among liberals and progressives. So it would be an attractive prospect if only it were true, but it's not for all the reasons that we've been discussing. Thank you, Naomi and Mark. Um, David, do you have any um, thoughts you'd like to add to that before we go to questions? You are on mute. Uh, I think I've been reading the questions. For those of you who are interested in our analysis of the cost of SMRs, uh, you can go to the, as I mentioned before, you can go to the AIFA website and see what, what we've written. Uh, the, the, the claim that SMRs will be less expensive than uh, the large nuclear plants has been proven to be wrong just within the last three weeks uh, when the estimated cost of uh, the new scale SMR is uh, projected to be somewhere in the range of uh, $20,000 per kilowatt, which is even more expensive than the Vogel plant that Professor Jacobson mentioned. Uh, for the other SMR designs, they're, they're afraid to even give out what it's gonna cost. Uh, the only one other SMR design that we know whose cost we know is the uh, Bill Gates reactor from Terra Power. Uh, they're estimating somewhere in the range of $12,000 per uh, kilowatt. Uh, so these are not gonna be inexpensive sources of power. None of them have been built. So all these claims about how safe they're gonna be, how cheap they're gonna be is pure speculation. And now, well, why don't we do some answer some questions? Great, thank you, everyone. Um, we do have a lot of things going on in the chat. So the best way to get your question seen is to put it in the Q and A portion. I will start with some that have been, um, and we're not going to be able to get to all of them because we do have um, quite a lot of people on the call. Um, but we will try to get through as many as we can. Um, I'll start with um, what is the best, most succinct, powerful argument to give my state senator who supports SMR, SMRs? Well, I would say it's, in fact, ignoring all the security problems and health problems, I mean, just the fact that it takes so long between planning and operation and the cost, you know, that just, it's just, there's no reason we have wind and solar that are cheaper and can be implemented much quicker. And that's what we need to do is to implement technologies that we have right now as fast as possible. And so it just, it makes no sense to uh, bet on something that doesn't exist. It's a non-existing technology. Yeah, I would just reinforce, if your state senator is a conservative, 
I would emphasize the extremely high cost. Why would you spend all this money when you can get power far more cheaply from renewables? And if your state senator is a progressive liberal who cares about climate change, then I would emphasize the long time scale to build these things, which makes them fail as a solution to climate change. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next one go, is from Alexis Doyle. And Alexis asks, is it fair to compare wind and solar um, intermittent sources of energy to nuclear baseload sources? Um, yes, because first of all, nuclear, because it's baseload, it does not match power demand. <laughs> demand is intermittent and variable. And the key is to match demand with supply. So if, if nuclear is baseload, which it is in all but two countries of the world, then you still need backup. You need natural gas or hydro usually. Those are the two backup sources today uh, to meet that continuously changing demand. With wind and solar, we're gonna, instead we're gonna get rid of gas, but we're gonna still keep hydro, but we'll add batteries and other forms of electricity storage. So both of them need backup. But as we see, like in France, I mean, 70%, well, France has, you know, 70% of its electricity comes from nuclear. And the capacity factor last year was 52% in 2022, it was 52%. There was an offshore wind farm off of Scotland, a floating offshore wind farm, let, let alone, that capacity factor was 54% for the last five years on average. So right now we're seeing French nuclear is less reliable than offshore wind. So for, nuclear needs backup not only um, to meet the actual change in uh, difference between the demand and the supply, but it also needs backup when it's down, which in France was 48% of the hours per year. Now, some people argue in France and also in Germany, the nuclear follows the load somewhat. Uh, it does, it, it's, those are the two countries where it does follow load, so it doesn't um, just, it's not completely flat. However, load following does not meet it, mean it meets demand. It, load following just means it slowly ramps up. You still need backup to fill those gaps. But wind and solar can also load follow because you can you can they can compete in uh, markets for to get 15 minute advance power because you can do forecasting for wind and solar on time frame of of minutes to hours and even even over a day. So you could theoretically, and this has actually been tested, you can actually load follow with wind and solar as well, just like you can with nuclear, um, but not, I mean, they help. So anyway, they both need backup. Uh, and it's just really fallacious to say that just because nuclear is baseload, uh, that it doesn't need backup. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Okay. Great. No. Select another one. Um, let's see, and I can type this out in case uh, you need it again. Um, read decom um, regarding decommissioning, um, this question comes from Rhonda Roth. I see permit extension requests when I think it would be prudent to begin de decommissioning. For example, Turkey Point, um, an example that's at sea level with cooling ponds. How does this figure into the economics? Are the power companies trying to avoid the expense of decommissioning? Yeah. Well, I just say decommissioning, yeah, it's an expense, it could take up to 70 years in some cases, and then you got to store the waste for a lot longer, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so yeah, a lot of these costs are pushed off. So we don't really know what the true cost of the reactor is until you have decommissioned. And then you've got this wasted land, this land you can't occupy with anything with, with people, for example, for 10, uh, you know, several decades. Um, fortunately, it's possible. I saw that like one decommissioned so, uh, nuclear plant, they were putting solar panels on it. That's one actual use you can use with <laughs> an old nuclear plant. Uh, yeah, but the extra cost of decommissioning is often not properly accounted for. And we just don't know what their costs are until much later on. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Brian Stevenson is, are current batteries and battery technology sufficient to handle the inherent intermittency, intermittency issues of wind and solar? 
Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, Mark probably knows more about the details of batteries than I do, but I think it's important to step back and look at the big picture here. So we have a lot of evidence that the fossil fuel industry has been deliberately playing up the intermittency problem to try to persuade us that renewable energy isn't a realistic solution to the climate problem. So I think the intermittency problem question, demand, whatever word you want for it, has been really exaggerated by fossil fuel industry as part of their program to persuade us that we need to continue to use fossil fuels. But to the extent that it is a real problem, and we definitely need storage, I don't think anyone denies that renewable energy needs to be coupled to storage. It just seems to me that it would be far more rational, make much more sense to take some of the billions and billions of dollars that have been sunk into nuclear power and the new money that can is continued to be sunk into this really problematic technology, problematic on so many levels, that that money would be better spent on improving storage. And especially when you think about um, how many storage technologies already exist, they need to be upgraded, they need to be expanded, but batteries exist, they work. Um, you know, there's all kinds of other potential ways to store energy like compressed air. So I just think if you if you look at this, the question rationally and you see all the benefits of renewable energy, um, in terms of safety, in terms of cost, in terms of the speed at which we can build them, the money that we have to invest would be far better spent on um, improving our storage capacity to improve, you know, people call it pe penetration. I don't really like that word, but um, the point is we could scale up renewables faster and more effectively and at lower cost by investing in storage rather than in speculative and dangerous nuclear technologies. Yeah, I'll just add that. Batteries are the perfect backup. Um, they respond in milliseconds. So like a natural gas plant, a peaker plant, it takes five minutes to ramp up to 100%, whereas a battery takes a millisecond. So actually in South Australia, where there's a big battery system uh, installed a few years ago, a Tesla battery system, it saved millions of dollars because of the fact that it could ramp up so quickly compared to natural gas or any other type of backup. I mean, hydro is not too far behind the batteries. But in California, almost it's around two to three percent of of all the electricity is actually already backed up by batteries. Uh, the cost of batteries is between one hundred and two hundred dollars a kilowatt hour of storage. If that, it's really the cost that's the issue. If we can get it down to sixty dollars a kilowatt hour, then pretty much the game is over in terms, of, and that's expected by 2030, 20 or so to get it close to um, closer to sixty dollars a kilowatt hour. There, like a week ago or so. This iron air battery uh, was talked about a lot where there, it's, there's going to be a commercial plant in 2024. They're saying that cost is $20 a kilowatt hour. So if that's the case, if it actually pans out at $20 a kilowatt hour for iron air batteries for stationary electricity storage, then the game is definitely over. I mean, it's easy to, at that cost, to just get rid of all natural gas for backup and provide grid electricity for backup uh, inexpensively, but we have to actually see if, what that cost will be. I'm very optimistic though, that among all the potential battery solutions, uh, some will come through uh, within the next few years as being really low cost, but we're implementing a lot right now uh, as, as we speak. Great, thank you both. Uh, next question, one of the arguments for SMRs is that can they can be built assembly line fashion stamping out hundreds of them quickly. But doesn't the experience of France show us that standardized design can bake in standardized design flaws that can cause problems down the line? Yeah, this is a really tricky question and it's a big issue in a lot of areas of life, in technology and chemical regulation, all kinds of things. So standardization is, is a two-edged sword. And I think that the French experience, Gabriel Huck's Hex book, The Radiance of France, is very useful on this. Um, certainly, standardization helped France to get to the level it had of getting 70 to 80 percent of its electricity um, from nuclear. And the fact that the government played this central role in choosing the design, choosing the winner, in effect, uh, was a big part of that story. But it also locked in a certain uh, approach that maybe was not so flexible. So it's a really complicated issue, but I think that um, one of the things we do know is that part of the reason things in the United States have been so expensive is we never did standardize our design because the government didn't play a leading role in the way it did in the United in France. But it's not clear how small 
modular reactor solve that? I mean, unless you decide you want to nationalize electricity industry and let the federal government decide what the standard design should be, um, you're still going to face the problem that if this is left to the private sector, uh, it's not clear how you achieve standardization. And it's not clear that that standardization um, can be achieved again in the time frame that we need. And this is why I think it's really important to keep coming back to. I mean, we're facing a climate crisis. We're having this conversation to a very great extent because of climate change. If it weren't for the climate crisis, I don't think we'd even be having this conversation about nuclear fission in the United States. But we're having this conversation because we do have a crisis and we have to convert our energy system away from fossil fuels. And the question is, how do we do that? And so nuclear power can seem attractive because it has this capacity to supply large amounts of energy. That part of the claim is true, but the problem is we can't do it fast enough and we can't afford to wait another 20 or 30 years uh, for the SMR idea to get sorted out. So I'll just pass on the, to the next question. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Dustin. I'm going to say this incorrectly. Why Zephyr? His question is, wind and solar developers are also targeting pristine undeveloped wildlife habitats in Wyoming, while SMRs are being touted to save jobs where coal plants are scheduled to retire. How should rural economies like Wyoming view SMRs? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, I think of like biofuels. I mean, sure, biofuels help agriculture uh, farmers, but they're completely useless to solve the climate and air pollution problems we face. So whether SMRs provide jobs and improve the economy of a given state, you can say that with pretty much any technology you add it to that state, but that is decide the point as to whether it will actually help solve the climate or air pollution problems or energy security problems we face. And I, I say, no, they will not solve any problems we face, air pollution, climate or energy security problems, just make them worse because they're opportunity costs. So I think it's a moot point whether it helps Montana, uh, individual, you know, it helps the economy or jobs in Montana. Well, I think it was Wyoming, but here, maybe oh, I, can well, 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 that. I mean, I think this is actually another argument in favor of renewable energy, right? Because we have proof, we have proof that renewable energy can be completely compatible with ranching and other forms of agriculture. So all you have to do is go to West Texas and see that. Wind power has been a giant boon for West Texas. Uh, it's enabled lots of ranchers to supplement their income, to keep their kids on the farm because they now have an additional important source of income that complements the ranching operation. And if you go to Europe, um, I spent some time uh, in Austria a few years ago, took a bike trip through the sunflower fields of Austria. There are wind turbines scattered across agricultural Europe everywhere now, and they're completely compatible with agricultural uses. So whereas I don't really think most farmers or rural communities really want to have an SMR in their backyard. So I think the argument for rural communities really weighs heavily in favor of renewable energy and does not weigh in favor of nuclear power. Great, thank you. Um, another question from uh, Stephen Sondheim. How do we convince Congress, both houses and the administration to stop funding good money after bad? The economic argument could also include pressure from the public um, in response to utility costs. And at the same time, not, not time to um, affect CC, which I'm going to assume is carbon capture. Yeah, well, I think I could jump in on that one because this relates to some of the questions I've been raising. In my experience, most people are, are really ignorant of history in general, and they're particularly ignorant of the history of this industry. And most people really have very little idea how many billions of dollars have gone into subsidizing this industry for relatively modest reward. So we do have nuclear power in this country. About 20% of our electricity comes from nuclear power. That's not nothing. And it is an argument against 
um, prematurely closing down plants that are currently operating safely. But if you're talking about making good use of taxpayer money, the history of nuclear power shows us that this has not been a good investment. The amount of money we've spent, I mean, I haven't done a calculation, but I probably should. I mean, if you took all the billions and billions of dollars that have been spent on nuclear power in this country, including the waste disposal program, um, and divided it by the amount of energy we got, you know, the price per kilowatt hour would be astronomical. It's just not a good investment. It's not a good use of taxpayer funds. And I think the more we can remind people of that, and remind them that we have an alternative that is available now, that is much, much cheaper and can be stood up much more rapidly. I think that's a really powerful argument that many people are not aware of. And again, it gets back partly to industry disinformation. The fossil fuel industry wants us to think um, that renewable energy is very expensive. You can find lots of places online where they make that claim, uh, but it's simply not true. Yeah. Well, I'll just add that uh, lawmakers can benefit from information. And right now, the problem is that there's not enough information about the benefits of using renewables versus nuclear and investing. And I think most people are not aware of the, the time difference, the time crunch that we're facing, and how long it takes nuclear to get off the ground and its cost relative to renewables and what renewables are capable of doing. So I think it's mostly information that can help to persuade lawmakers to uh, stop funding this uh, ridiculous, this just a complete waste of money. I mean, along with some other technologies like carbon capture and direct air capture and blue hydrogen and bioenergy, just these are not technologies that are helpful for solving climate, air pollution or energy security problems, yet we spend a good portion of taxpayer money on them. Thank you. Next question um, refers to something Mark said in his presentation. I've heard the term heat pollution before, and if Mark could, and Mark mentioned anthropogenic heat emissions. Can you share more information on this concept? I'm wondering how damaging it is, especially compared to other kinds of emissions. Well, all, all a combustion produces heat, as, so vehicle combustion, uh, coal coal plant, electricity plant combustion, natural gas plant combustion, but so does nuclear uh, reaction. <laughs> so re nuclear reaction produces heat and some of that heat escapes directly and some is absorbed by water, which so water is used to cool down uh, nuclear reactors and that some of that water evaporates. So you get, so you get not only direct heat, but you, so we call that anthropogenic heat flux, uh, but you also get water vapor and that's anthropogenic water vapor flux. And there, the heating is can, from all sources worldwide um, for anthropogenic heat is on the order of, it's not huge, it's like 0.23 or 0.25% of global warming. Um, but when you look at, and it's just, and in terms of, I did a calculation for nuclear and per kilowatt hour of electricity generated, it's on the order of two grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, and so water vapor is another two grams or so per kilowatt hour. I think between the two of them are like four or five, four to five grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is not a lot, but it's not zero either. And you add that onto, but compare that to what we call the opportunity cost emissions from nuclear, the fact that you're waiting around for nuclear to be built uh, while you could have been building wind and solar much faster. You know, that's on the order of 60 to 70 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour electricity. So and then you add on top of that, there's another 60 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour just from building the reactor and refining the uranium. So when you add it all together, and there's uncertainties, of course, there's low and high estimates, but the range, when you compare that, to the overall total from like wind, tur wind turbines on the order of 10 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So when you, add, you divide the nuclear total emissions by the wind total emissions, for example, you get nine to 39 nine to 37 times more CO2 per kilowatt hour for nuclear than wind. Uh, but the, that heat emissions, is a, it's a small portion. It's on the order of two to three grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. I think the yeah. issue with the heat also is has to do with, with water and cooling. So a lot of times people think of nuclear reactors as you know relatively clean because they do have 
um, you know, very low greenhouse gas emissions when they're operating. But one of the things that doesn't get talked about is the heat pollution. And that goes into the ecosystem. So enormous amounts of water have to be used to cool nuclear power plants. That's what those big cooling towers are that you see in every picture of a nuclear power plant. And that water then gets discharged to the environment. And I've seen people claim that, you know, there's no net lost there because the water goes back to the environment. But what it's that argument misses is the huge amount of heat, which is actually quite damaging to ecosystems. And we know that in coastal reactors like Diablo Canyon and Indian Point, um, massive ecological, adverse ecological effects on fish and wildlife in the adjacent uh, waterways, or if it's put into land-based ecosystems, uh, rivers, lakes, tremendous amounts of ecological damage. And now imagine that in a place like the American Southwest, which is already running out of water because of climate change and drought, you just don't have the available water that you need to cool these reactors. Now, small reactors, of course, would have smaller cooling needs, but to generate the same amount of electricity, now you have to have a lot of them. So the net effect, even though it may be more distributed, it's still going to have a net really serious adverse effect on the ecosystems of these areas. Great, thank you everyone. Um, another question from Steven Singer, do you believe federal money approved by the Biden administration and the previous Congress will lead to more SMRs? Uh, well, I think it'll lead to more spending on SMRs. <laughs> it won't lead to more <laughs> SMRs. I, I'm really doubtful, you know, they may be come up with some test reactor at some point, but it's going to be so uncompetitive with wind and solar, which will have just be dominating. And so it'll just, it, we'll just see it's going to be a boondoggle. It'll just take us a while to, for everybody to, else to see that. Great. Thank you. Um, Another question, living in Appalachia, what would be a good argument against the Virginia governor's proposed energy plan prioritizing placing SMRs in the coal fields from an environmentalist perspective? Well, I think it's all the problems that we've talked about. It's, it's not going to help anything, first of all. Uh, it's much better if you have coal fields and you want to use that space for something, put solar panels there, that'll be much more effective. You'll be able to do it fast because it's all tight. Let's say he wants to do it today, put SMRs. Well, they don't exist. <laughs> There's no, they're not, they're not commercially available anywhere. There won't be at least the 2030 is like the estimated date of at least a test reactor, but that's not even sure. They'll probably be delayed. And that then that's not even commercial. So, you know, it could be 10, 15, even 20 years before you actually see anything. So why would, you know, if, you, if he's interested in solving a problem, bringing some benefits to the local community, build solar, you know, put some wind, batteries, go into electric vehicles, heat pumps, energy efficiency. So all existing technologies that are just much more efficient that you can implement right now. And yes. that's... Yeah, I think that, I mean, this is in a way it's sort of heartbreaking because it's another example of the continued exploitation and disrespect for rural communities in this country. So here you have communities in Appalachia who have been subject to one of the most dangerous, most polluting, most harmful technologies in the history of mankind, coal and coal mining. Uh, and people have really suffered. And now they're suffering from losing those jobs, which you know, were never healthy jobs, but they were at times well-paying jobs. So what are you going to do instead now, put another risky and dangerous technology in those same communities, but it's a technology that actually generates very few jobs. So it's not really a solution to the economic needs of those communities. Um, so I would just hope that rural advocates don't get conned by that promise and would recognize that rural development is about education, it's about job training, it's about building diversity economies with safe technologies. And as Mark just said, you know, one of the one of the most cost efficient things we can do uh, on the energy front is energy efficiency. And yet almost no one advocates it because what? It's not glamorous. It's not sexy. Um, there's this sort of promise of the technological fix that seems glamorous. And so a lot of politicians are attracted to it. It sounds like they're doing something meaningful for their communities. But in this case, they're really not. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you both. Um, we are coming up to the top of the hour, so I'm going to find one more question, and then um, if you would all like to have some closing thoughts. And um, once again, the webinar recording will be made available afterwards. You can find our um, our contact information on the website, and we will try and follow up with people who have um, questions about anything that was spoken about today. Um, one us we'll do this last question from Julie Bolthouse. Uh, a main driving force behind SMR seems to be data center development. Do you have any suggestions on how, as a society, we control the explosive growth in this industry? There's so much technological advancement dependent on them. Don't know who might want to speak to that. Hmm. Well, I mean, there are alternatives to SMRs for data centers, first of all. So assuming we're going to have data centers, we need can, in the future more of them. Powering them with renewables is the way that all these companies, there are 380 international companies that have committed to 100% renewable energy, including eight of the 10 biggest companies in the world. So the companies that are actually building data centers, they've already committed to 100% renewables. I don't know any company that's committed to uh, even one SMR. Uh, so, but there are, they're all committing in their global operations to 100% renewables. They're building solar and wind to power their data centers. I mean, they're actually, they're building them in Iowa and in the Great Plains, for example, because that's where the wind is and it's really dirt cheap. So I think, I don't, I think the companies have already spoken. They already decided they're going to power their data centers with, uh, with 100% renewable energy. They've, they've committed to that 380 of them. You know, by, by the way, I should point out, it's, it is kind of telling that there is no company that is committed to nuclear energy. I mean, they're all committed to renewable energy because the business world knows this. I mean, it's really weird how, you know, the, the people in the business world, most people in the public, they're, they're so attuned that the solution is just renewable energy. Yet, you know, it's just a small group of people who are pushing for these nuclear reactors, but they have a large voice in Congress. And uh, it's just, I think it's just a, cadre of misinformation, just so much misinformation about nuclear in particular, but also there's you know other technologies uh, that are trying to are guiding our policies. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, we are at the end of the hour. Um, David, Naomi, or Mark, if you have any last um, thoughts that you'd like to share with us, and um, we will make sure to have the webinar be available afterwards online. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. Uh, I think the presentations by Mark and Naomi were excellent, uh, and the chat was definitely uh, fired up. If we could use some of that energy uh, to replace SMRs, uh, we wouldn't have such a demand for them. Uh, and follow us, we are going to be having uh, follow-up uh, SMRs over the next few months on, on other issues related to uh, the proposals for, these, for the new nuclear plants. Uh, check the IEFA website. Uh, we're happy to have you read our stuff. Contact us with for, if you have questions or information. And have a good and safe day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.